Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Cormier, and I'm going to be your moderator today. And I have the uh, total privilege of being here with Robin Rosa and Martha Burtis to talk about the Ace Framework. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi, Dave. Hi. Uh, maybe we can start out by you guys telling us uh, a little bit about who you are and where you come from. Sure. Um, I'm Robin DeRosa, and I'm coming to you semi-live from central New Hampshire, where I direct the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State University, which is uh, one of our state colleges, one of four um, here in New Hampshire. And I am Martha Burtis. I also work at Plymouth State University in the Open Collab with Robin. Um, and I am also coming to you semi-live, but obviously we are not in the same place. And I'm Dave Cormier. I work at the University of Windsor. I'm a digital learning strategist here. Uh, so uh, we're here to talk about the ACE framework. And I wonder which of you is going to give us that 47.2 second elevator pitch to give us some kind of scene setting for what the ACE framework is and uh, what it's for. Um, I can do that because uh, I enjoy the aerial view. And then I like to make Martha do sort of like the, the actual work of things. Um, but the ACE framework is, um, I, I really maybe better to tell the story of, of how it came to be, which was when COVID hit and colleges had to quote unquote pivot really quickly to um, emergency remote instruction. I guess we had some concern in the collab that there was a little too much focus on the tech tools that were going to drive that period of online learning and less focus on um, how teachers needed to rethink their interactions with their curriculum and their students during COVID. So we created a framework um, inside of which sit very particular practices. So it's even though it's a framework and it's conceptual, it has a lot of concrete practices to go with it. Um, but the framework is really a guide to say um, during times of crisis and particular particularly during the remote teaching of COVID, um, you have to think not just about your tools, but about your values, um, your goals, the challenges that your students face, um, and you have to really center pedagogy more than you center technology. So that's um, why we developed the ACE framework to help our faculty as they were engaging in that quote unquote pivot. And I say quote unquote pivot because that pivots like a, a beautiful, delicate dance move. And I don't think anybody who was actually doing it was feeling very graceful or delicate uh, during during it. So um, Martha really helped sort of flesh out um, the, the way the framework works online and how faculty um, can engage with it. So I think if you want, Dave, she can kind of take you for a drive through ACE a little bit. That sounds awesome. Take us through a yeah. ride. For oh, sure. So yeah, just so everybody can understand, like when we say framework, we literally do mean framework. Um, uh, the ACE um, framework is divided into these three sort of values, adaptability, connection, and equity. And then within those, those are subdivided at the assignment level, the course level, and the institution level. Um, so there's, uh, if I do my math correctly, 18. <laughs> Um, practices in total, but really for faculty, it's the ones at assignment level and course level that are really um, going to be the most relevant. The institutional level is more for administrators and um, policy makers. If you want to just jump into one of those, um, just, you can just before we one. do, just before we do, yeah. I see the way that this is set up. So there's six across the top. So there's um, six assignment level uh, ones, six course level ones, six institutional right. level ones. So adaptability, connection, and equity. Can you talk, just before we jump yeah. in, can we get the overall piece? What's of the difference those between from? those three things and, and what does that look like? Just so we have the context when we get into the pieces. So the top two levels are the assignment level. And I think anybody who works with faculty knows that, you know, it, it's great to talk <laughs> about your vision, um, but when the rubber hits the road, you know, people have content and activities um, and course plans, um, class plans even. So the question is like, what are you actually gonna do in your classes? So those assignment levels are really about um, how to how to rethink um, the very micro parts of your of your course plans um, 
and how you would retool your assignment given the challenges of COVID. The course level are a little bit bigger. Those are about like modalities, for example, how might you deliver your course? They're about how you might set up your syllabus, how you might choose materials for your courses. And then the bottom um, six are the institution levels. And these are uh, really different. Instead of practices with activities, like um, you'll see when you click into the top ones, um, Martha will show you what's in there. But um, the institution levels are really designed more for administrators and committees in particular um, with guiding questions. So one of the things I was really concerned about with ACE was, was institutional alignment because it's all well and good to give faculty like really um, flexible or innovative or interesting approaches to uh, rethinking their courses. But if the institution isn't aligned um, and they aren't getting certain kinds of supports, then you can really end up feeling like you're not having a very big impact. An example of that might be, let's say you're designing your courses to work really well in low bandwidth environments um, and you're trying to think hard about some of your students who may not have access to the technology that they need during emergency remote learning but your institution isn't doing anything to consider Wi-Fi hotspots or um, uh, renting out devices. or right. So we can get a lot more bang for our buck, so to speak, if all of the parts um, of our, from our inside our courses to our course designs to our programs and our institutions are pulling in the same direction. Um, so that's the institutional levels is, is uh, set up a little bit differently, but it's aligned to, but it's designed to encourage that kind of alignment. Very cool. So uh, then if, if we're going to jump in, then I will uh, select the rethinking fairness one. That's certainly been uh, one of the things that I've been confronted with during uh, the whole COVID thing is that I thought I was running a fair classroom and doing that kind of stuff beforehand, but I've really been forced to sort of dig deeper and think more about that in my own practice. And it's certainly been a conversation I've had with tons and tons of people in the last 10 months. So maybe we can jump in here and see, uh, see what we got. And you can talk us through what uh, what this looks like. You picked my personal favorite, Dave. Huzzah! Um, <laughs> oh, look at you. It is me. Um, so each of the um, practices has a short introductory video, Robin, myself, or Hannah Hounsel in the collab talking a little bit about the overall, it's overall idea behind that practice. Um, and then the um, practices themselves are all structured the same. It starts with the learn section, which are some techniques or activities that we've pulled together to help people explore that idea a little bit more. Um, this one in particular, as you kind of mentioned, I feel like fairness is something that just has come into such stark focus mm -hmm. during COVID in ways that it hasn't before. For me, it's actually, it sounds crazy to say this, but it's almost a little like exciting because in the, you know, a year and a half ago, if I had talked about fairness with faculty, yeah a lot of them just wouldn't have had the grounding to understand where I was coming from. But I yeah. think so many of our faculty have now seen firsthand um, what their students are dealing with um, across the board. And, and suddenly it just becomes so clear that every student's experience is different and every student's um, challenges are different. Those were all the case before. It just yeah. wasn't exposed. It just wasn't evident. Um, and so in a way, this has been kind of an, an amazing time to suddenly see faculty say, oh, I never realized before that I was um, assuming a level of, sub of kind of objectivity to my teaching and to my uh -huh. students' experience that has never really existed. So, and then if you scroll down a little bit past those, uh, the teach section, we have this explore section. This is where we relied so heavily on the amazing community of educators that we're a part of um, through networking online, primarily through you know tools like Twitter. Um, we just spent a lot of time mining things that other people were doing. Um, some of it is older pieces that were written, but I will also say the amount of activity happening yeah. in spring and summer in our field was mind blowing. Every day I felt like there was some new, whether it was a new, you know, piece of writing or a new framework or a new um, set of tools or, or techniques that people were exploring. It really was kind of a joy to put together the resources for this because there was no, if anything, it was hard to edit the list. It was hard yeah. to come up with, you yeah. know, you wanted to add more and more and more. 
Um, and then the I've already, I've, yeah, go I've ahead. already been using your framework and your list of resources because you, what you have done here is organize these things into pieces that I can actually get whenever I need them. So if I'm in a conversation with somebody and I have one of the 10 lists of resources that I collected early right. on in the pandemic, and then I'm yeah. like uh, scrolling through it. Whereas what this does is it not only provides the, the sort of structure that allows us to sort of learn from it, but also for somebody like me, it organizes all of the pieces so I can go in and find the things quickly and serve effectively. So I really do appreciate this piece here has already been something that I've been using. So thank you so much for this. Oh, that's great. I also yeah. want to point out um, the Slipper Camp resources. We had um, kind of a, a softer version of a boot camp um, <laughs> just as COVID was, was hitting um, to help our faculty really think about a lot of um, the things that ultimately became part of the ACE framework. So in the Slipper Camp resources, there are really some great tidbits like on this page, the cruelty-free syllabus that uh, was developed by our colleague, Matthew Cheney, um, which is really about at the syllabus level, you know, how do you, um, how do you think about the messages that you are sending to your students about what the experience will be like in the course? And uh, obviously he's very influenced there by folks like Jesse Stommel um, in thinking about cruelty in your syllabus and uh, folks like Sarah Goldrick Rabb thinking about um, basic needs in the syllabus. Um, so there's a lot of really neat, short kind of webinar like things with um, additional resources there that you can check out when you go into the slipper camp parts of the- And, our, and, and yeah. as, a, uh, as a greedy, um, uh, presenter are these resources that I can go in and steal? Yeah, so anything that's in the ACE <laughs> framework that we created is openly licensed. Um, uh, other things might just be what we call free stuff on the internet. So like sometimes we might have linked to something that's not actually openly licensed. You can of course use everything, um, but if it's stuff that's created by the collab um, or the framework itself, all of that stuff is CC by. Yep. So for engage, we had a couple of different ways. It, it probably is worth kind of pointing out at this, you know, at this juncture that like the ACE framework was our professional development work for the summer. Right. So in addition to the building the framework, building this resource website, we ran a four week workshop um, with folks from um, PSU uh, walking them through this as a curriculum. And so some of these engagement op opportunities have passed like the, uh, the join a meeting. Those were some meetings we ran over the summer, um, but others people can continue to obviously um, do. The discuss on Twitter is just using a hashtag to talk about that practice. One of my personal favorites is the submit something engagement because basically what it allows is any person to um, to come along and add a um, an idea or a practice or a technique that is related to this. Um, to, to this particular uh, practice of their own. And it immediately gets added to the bottom of this page. Um, so we have a little bit of a library. I don't know whether or not any yet. So we have one that somebody added here. Um, somebody who was in our workshop last summer had added. Very cool. um, so it's kind of a neat way to continue to grow um, the resource yeah. as well with, um, with the people who were actually working with it over the summer. Uh, we encourage people to use Hypothesis to annotate any of this. Um, and then for people at PSU, we also had a, um, a Microsoft Teams uh, team set up for the um, ACE framework where they could go in and talk among our community about using um, any of this within their teaching. So that's the basic structure of each practice. Um, they all kind of follow that same structure. Um, and I just want to point out, like, the, the idea here was obviously to support um, faculty, staff, and institutions during COVID, um, but the ACE framework, I think, was helpful in some other situations. Um, I have talked about it with folks in California um, in terms of wildfires, and so I think one of the things about ACE, and I think in some ways maybe it's time you know, not the resources, but like the, the the time of ACE has passed and we will probably be carrying a lot of this forward into our next project. Um, but the idea behind ACE was really not about COVID. It was about um, the idea that if you're human, which most of our <laughs> students are, um, 
you're likely to be engaged in learning during times of challenge or even trauma. So if you think of K-12 and then you think of college, that's a lot of years to be engaged in learning. And it's very rare that someone's gonna go through 12, 14 plus whatever years of schooling without, for example, having a significant illness or having the death of a family member or having a regional emergency like a flood or a fire. Um, in this case, it was a global pandemic. It hit us, you know, collectively all at once, which really, you know, um, catalyzed a lot of this development. But you can use these kinds of things when you're just thinking about the fact um, that most of us are going to be dealing with these kinds of challenges. And if we do build more flexible, um, connected and equitable architectures for learning, people are not gonna have to check their humanity at the door when they engage in something like college. And if you care about things like retention and completion, well, um, yeah. or even more surprisingly, if you care about people, then these are good ideas, I think, um, outside of COVID. So that's why uh, Martha and I made a commitment not to put anything into the ACE framework that we didn't think would be a good long-term practice after um, COVID because we feel like these are the kinds of things that can help us adjust our learning environments just for the fact of, of being human. Uh, you bring up the, the question of retention and it brings me to my, my favorite current question in the field, which is student engagement. So um, right now for the first time in my career, I can imagine talking to a senior administrator about engagement and having them actually care uh, because the open, the, what online learning, the, the sort of move to online has done is made students realize that they have a choice, particularly regional students, particularly localized students, but students generally have way more choice than they used to have. Well, they may have already ha always had that choice, but they didn't realize it was there. And suddenly the experience that a student has as an institution is actually gonna become increasingly more important for the hard numbers that keeps the lights on inside the institution. And so if I was, and this maybe goes down to some of the institutional pieces, but if I'm going to, um, do you think that this fits in with that engagement conversation? And when I say engagement, I don't mean, um, I don't mean that in a banal sense. I mean like legitimately students caring about and engaged in their learning. Can you talk about this from that perspective? Like how that really, like you say, addresses the always problems we've had in education. Yeah, I mean, this, you're just putting your finger on so much of my own motivation for, for being, in, um, being focused on ACE because when emergency remote learning came, um, my institution and many institutions nationally uh, really transitioned to the most sort of ubiquitous kind of online learning, I think. Um, you'll see this in some kind of online learning standards that are very popular um, nationally in the US. Um, but a lot of those approaches to online learning are a little bit more, they're very flexible, which is great, and that's part of ACE, but they tend to be very competency-based, very mastery-oriented, and very focused on content, content delivery. Um, and content delivery is in, important. I mean, you know, I have a PhD, I like content, right? I like stuff learning, you know, ideas. But I will also say that the engagement piece often falls right out because that's, um, you know, that sort of old banking model of making the deposits of the content. And a lot of our online learning architectures are really focused in that way. And when we go to flexible architectures, we default a lot of times to content mastery because students can do it more individually. Um, they can do it on their own time, right? There's lots of benefits. So the challenge for ACE was really to say, particularly like at a school like Plymouth State, where we are a regional institution, we serve a lot of local students, we're very residential based, we're very place based, um, and we have a big focus on teaching community and collaboration. So the challenge for us was to say like, when we move online, we don't want all our courses to look the same. We don't want all of our students to be working independently. We don't want um, content to fully replace collaboration. We still wanna be inquiry-based. We still wanna be project-based um, and we still wanna be experiential. 
which is very challenging, I think, for some educators. Um, even though connected learning is a thing, lots of faculty um, are, uh, are not as familiar with how to use technology to connect people together, right? They use technology to deliver. That's like the mechanism of the learning management system to manage content. So ACE is very much about how that connected um, section of ACE is really very much about um, thinking about engagement through the process of human connection and collaboration. Um, and that if students become participants who can also bring themselves into the course, um, we posit that they're therefore going to be more connected. It's one of the pillars sort of of open pedagogy really. So that's a big part of, of ACE. And one of the things Martha really brings to the table is her experience in, um, in connected learning and in uh, online environments that really foster community. And, and that's where I was gonna put the next question actually. And, and Martha, feel free to ignore my question and say something smarter. Okay. But, um, in terms of when I look at this, the first my first sort of thought is, oh, it's these are to some degree a response to the affordances of the internet, right? So there are some things that are just different. So if you look at the community, you look at OER, you look at a sort of high flex. Uh, if you these are all sort of things that have not just started ten months ago, or twelve months ago. There are things that are brand new. There are things we've been forced to deal with. So how much of this do you think? is a response to those affordances of the internet, just how the world, how learning has had to change because of um, the ubiquity of information, because of connection, because of, and in response to some of the amazing capacities we now have too. Yeah, I think it's an interesting needle that we're trying to thread in a way. That's my latest new expression, by the way. <laughs> um, I always have one um, because it, you know, my background is really in in technology and academic tech. That's what my my graduate degree in is in. That's what I worked in for years and years at Mary Washington. In that work, more and more, I was doing um, faculty development and instructional design. And my focus now at PSU is really on those latter topics. I I don't work in academic tech anymore, but I certainly talk about technology a lot, and I um, talk with faculty about how they use technology a lot. One of my favorite things that I've said in the past is, you know, we always have these weird conversations where people will say, you know, for years and years and years, you'd be in a conversation, people would say, it's not about the technology, it's about the teaching, um, which is a really difficult thing to argue against because obviously it's about the teaching, like that's the most critical thing um, is, is our teaching because we are teachers. Um, but I also have always pushed back on that because, um, the reality is that we have technologies uh, at our, at our, available to us right now that have the potential to um, show us new ways of thinking about teaching and new ways of thinking about knowledge and new ways of thinking about collaboration and communication and community, what it means to be part of an academic community and, a, and an intellectual community. Those new ways of thinking are something we have to become adept at. We can't... Um, we can't necessarily ignore those things and, and say, but it's only about the teaching. The teaching is all that matters. So there's this interesting kind of, like I said, threading the needle or balancing act that we need to do. I think one of the things that was alarming as COVID was breaking was how much of the rhetoric was focusing on technology as a panacea or a solution to this crisis we were facing. Um, and that's super problematic because yeah. yes, the technology shows us new things, but we are the ones who have to make the critical choices of how, about how we're ultimately going to um, enable those things or enact those things or engage with those things. Um, so I look at like, the, you'll notice, I think that maybe the only technique in ACE that's not tech, technology agnostic as the internet is as classroom and community. I don't think there are any others that kind of call out tech in any specific no. way. Um, and that's really, um, I'm going to say deliberate, even though I just had to question whether or not that was the case. <laughs> but it really was deliberate because um, it's not that if you dig into these, there isn't lots of mention of technology, but um, forefronting our humanity in in make in, in all of this and our need to be able to make choices, not just choices, but informed choices about how we use technology, I think is the work that we need to be doing a better job at. 
Um, it would be, you know, you, you would have to call me a liar if I said I don't think technology is a critical piece of the future of higher education, because obviously I think that, thanks Dave, um, obviously I think that, but, um, but I think it's so much more complex and nuanced than, than we usually, than we usually acknowledge, and certainly than at the institutional level, it's usually acknowledged. I don't know if that answered your question, but I liked saying it. So that was great. There you go. So we have uh, we have a couple minutes left, and um, there are a whole bunch of people who have just watched this video, and they're like, "I wanted to use the AIDS framework." So for those people who have made it to the end of this video and are now thinking, "I want to use the ACE framework," what's the first step in the process? What should they do right now? Um, well, on the ACE Framework page, there is a link that's called How to Use the ACE Framework. So that's a good starting place. Um, and there's really two ways that you can engage with ACE. And then I'll say a third quick thing afterwards. So the first is that you can just dip in and out of the practices that are interesting to you. And that's probably what I would suggest. Um, you know, it's, it's designed to be learner driven. So you figure out what the parts are that would be helpful to you and you can dip in and out of the practices. And each practice I think could be kind of like a three week course on its own, or it could be a half hour of learning for you. So you can use that, um, to scale according to what's interesting. Um, also, if you look at how to use the ACE framework, you will see in there, the workshop that Martha mentioned, it's a four week um, curriculum and uh, you can run that with your faculty. We've had other institutions use the ACE framework with the four week workshop. And Martha and I are super happy to have a quick meeting with you um, to help you kick off the facilitation of a workshop like that at your own institution. So uh, we won't, we, we don't facilitate them for other institutions, but we will do a kind of train the trainer thing and, and help get you ready if, if you want to do it. Um, but the last thing I would say is, you know, one of the benefits of having Martha as your collaborator is that um, the way we think of professional development, I think, is that it is a, a learning community. It's larger than the CoLab, larger than Plymouth State. So we're always engaging in that. So um, Martha is just a wealth of, you know, I may say, oh, I think we really need to tackle such and such. And then the next day there's a new framework, you know, with clickable things. and. Because I think, you know, we don't really plan to rest on ACE. We plan um, to, to keep putting stuff out, revising, revisioning, rethinking. So one of the best things I'd suggest is join up um, with a learning community, whether that's following the collab on social media or like checking our events calendar. If you don't have a learning community of your own around pedagogy um, or engaging with folks on Twitter or whatever. Um, because ACE gives you a lot, a lot of things to work with, but I think it's less about that content than it is about ongoing conversation. And the collab is, you know, part of our mission is to provide that beyond Plymouth State um, as a as a public service. So engage with us and and future conversations because you'll see probably some things we think now about ACE. You know, Lord knows Martha and I have uh, been doing lots of workshops for lots of institutions about high flex and, um, you know, month to month, our perceptions of high flex change quite a bit. So we don't expect um, the content in ACE to stay stable. So uh, join in the conversation is what I would say. Martha, last thoughts? Oh, I would just say this. If you visit the ACE um, page, one of the things that you will also see is that there's it, you know, the, the ACE framework is at the center, but we also recognize that it doesn't accommodate or address every kind of, um, every kind of situation that you might encounter in your teaching. There's lots of kind of ancillary stuff. We have a student guide for ACE. We have something called complicating the conversation that really drives into some of those situations that maybe those techniques don't feel like they intersect with. Um, so we encourage you to kind of take the time to explore a little and, and let us know if you think there's, you know, more that we could be doing uh, on that front. It may not be that we're revising ACE, but as Robin said, we do have plans for the future um, of what the next step of this looks like. Can I you put a logo in now? now? Like something I fancy that's that like, now, stay but... tuned, you know, yeah, some tuned. music and an um, icon. Yeah, that's what but, we want. Um, but the community can help us shape what that next, that next thing looks like. So stay, stay in touch. That is a perfect final comment. Thanks, guys, for coming in and, and having this conversation. I know that uh, I enjoyed it, but I always enjoy talking to you guys. So I uh, hope everybody else has a fantastic day. Take care of yourselves. Still wash your hands. Still don't touch your face. 
and uh, we'll see you all again soon. <laughs> <laughs> nom nom nom.